I'll be reading from John chapter 17 as we continue through Jesus' prayer after we go to the Lord in prayer ourselves. Our Heavenly Father, it is such a joyous time of the year. And we need to be this way every day. We need to experience the joy in our life every single day. And I know we let the burdens of this life really tug on us and pull us down. And yet that's when we need to turn to you. For our joy is complete in our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we hear joy to the world, well, our Lord and Savior is the joy to the world. And this morning I pray that we would have open and receptive hearts to your word. For your word is truth. Your word guides us, it directs us, if we allow it to. And it will bring joy to our life. I ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten it for us this morning. And that the Holy Spirit open every heart. Father, we need your word. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we need to take hold of everything that you've given us. And believe. Have faith. And move forward for the cause of Christ. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. John chapter 17, beginning in verse 6. This is Jesus praying. I have manifest thy name unto the men which thou givest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou givest them me, and they, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou givest me. And they have received them. And they know surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine. And all mine are thine, and all thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep, the, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that thou may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou hast given me I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them but thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, and even as I am not of the world. I pray not that Thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou should keepest them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. We're continuing through this section of Scripture that's concerning Jesus' prayer. And it's important for us to see something. This isn't the first time Jesus prayed. No. It's not the first time He prayed for His disciples. Over in Luke chapter 6, it tells us that Jesus prayed before He chose His disciples. During the course of His earthly ministry, He prayed for them over in John chapter 6. Now, as Jesus approaches the end of his earthly ministry, he prays for them again over in Luke and here in John. I want to tell you something that most Christians don't realize. Jesus still prays for us. You realize? He continues to pray for believers. Someone asked me one time, people pray in heaven? What is prayer? You're talking with God. Romans 8, 34 tells us this. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, 
who also maketh intercession for us. That's prayer. He's interceding on our behalf even now in heaven. It's amazing. It? He's right here this morning. I hope you can feel it. He's here. And He's in heaven and He's making intercession for us. Hebrews 7.25 confirms this. Wherefore He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come into God by Him, seeing that He ever liveth to make intercession for them. He is thinking about you. He's thinking about me. Right now this morning in a revelation says that the devil makes accusations against us day and night. And Jesus is telling, I don't know what you're talking about. These people are mine. They're innocent. They're forgiven. You know, that continual prayer of intercession reveals Jesus' concern and his love for his apostles and every single born-again believer for the last 2,000 years and everyone moving forward. You know, that small flock of disciples was given to the Lord Jesus Christ by the Father. And Jesus prayed, the men which thou givest me out of the world. Those men have, were separated out of the world. Interesting, the word, the word world occurs 18 times in this chapter alone. The world. Our enemy is the world. Our mission field is the world. We have to go into the enemy territory to give them the gospel. Isn't that amazing? That's what Jesus said. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. We have a mission. But the separation of those men was by the electing work of God the Father which they had been given as a gift to Jesus Christ. These men no longer in the world. Were they sinners? Yes. Did they fall short? Yes. But the God, the Father said, these are them, and Jesus knew that too. He's God. Jesus made this clear in chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I wanted to quote that passage because it's a powerful eternal security passage. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Dan and I were talking about that last night. One of our friends on Facebook believes you can lose your salvation. You need to read your Bible. Time after time after time, there are eternal security passages. And I don't know how much clearer you can make it than him that cometh to me, if you come to me for salvation, you're never going to be cast out. How much clearer can it be? Now, when we speak of the disciples here, forgive me if I go down a rabbit trail occasionally. We speak of the disciples here being separated out of the world. It doesn't mean they're taken out of the world physically or they were not to have contact with a lost, wicked world. No, that's not what it means. They were to be involved in giving out the gospel to the world, but not living like the world. That's the way we're separated too, folks. We are to be out in the world giving the gospel, but not living like the world, not getting involved in the things of the world. You see, they separated themselves from the evil and the sinfulness of this world, even though they were sinners just as we are. But the difference is they, like we are, sinners saved by grace. Every believer is that way. We're sinners saved by grace. When Jesus says they, speaking of the disciples, have kept thy word, Jesus praises them for responding to the message of God in Jesus Christ. They have kept thy word. Now this didn't happen overnight. I'm going to tell you right now. When you witness to someone, it's very rare that they right to accept Jesus Christ. You continually give them the word and somebody else gives them the word. And eventually it, it clicks, it comes to heart, and they begin to keep the word. Once again, let me say that the disciples were not perfect, but they had the right commitment. They were committed to Jesus Christ. Oh, that we need, need to get hold of the fact that we are not perfect, but we can have the right and proper commitment to and for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's important. You see, the faith of the disciples 
in Jesus was a trust in the union with the Father. Verse 8 says, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didn't send me. That is really important. See, everybody for the last 2,000 years has been given the same opportunity. You've been given, you've heard the words, the words have been given, and you receive them. Well, you know, you can receive something, but not take it to heart. That's why he goes on, and have known surely that I came from thee. They have heard and they have believed. You see, we have the word of God. We have the Bible. And it's available to us. How many of you just have one Bible in your house? None of you, I'm sure. You probably, have, you probably can't tell me. I can't tell how many Bibles I have in my house. We have that. But there's more than just possessing the Bible. The important thing is what you do with those wonderful words of Scripture. You only, as in all portions of Scripture, you only have two choices. You either respond in the manner of the world and you reject the Word of God, or you follow the example of the disciples. You receive the Word. You believe it without doubt that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came into this world to carry out the work of salvation. The faith of the disciples was manifest in their obedience. They, they were obedient to his words because they believed in his divine mission. The Lord reaffirmed this back in John 16, 27. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Faith. Faith, that's, that's an important point. And because of their faith, they worked long and hard for the gospel of Jesus Christ and they carried the message of salvation out into the world. This reminds me of what James explains over in James chapter 2, beginning at verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Hey, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without works is dead. And we see that the disciples, later called the apostles, that faith caused them to work. A believer needs to work. The work of an apostle was demonstrated by his absolute faith in Jesus Christ going out and doing the works of the Lord. The average Christian demonstrates his faith by working for Jesus Christ. You know, the Lord's Prayer here, these verses from 6 to 19, are particularly for the 11 disciples. Judas wasn't there at this time. Judas is gone. That applies, and it applies so to all believers. As Jesus prayed in verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, through their witness, in other words. All those who are going to believe through their witness. Think about that for a moment. If the disciples had remained silent, if they didn't go out into the world and give the gospel, where would we be today? Who would have taken the gospel out if they didn't? No one. If Peter had not stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached that gospel, those 3,000 people would have been saved. And those 3,000 people took the gospel message all over the Roman Empire. The church in Rome was started long before any of the apostles got there. Those people that took the gospel back with them. But if they would remain silent, where would we be today? Hmm. But they could not stay quiet. They had to tell the world of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, we must all do the same thing. We have to reach the world for the cause of Christ, whether it's supporting missions or talking to your next door neighbor or witnessing somebody on the internet. That's our mission. We have to go into the world and, and stand strong. 
I want you to pay close attention that in verse 9, Jesus says he's praying for his disciples, but he also makes a point of this. I pray not for the world. Jesus at that time was not praying for the world and its hostility and its unbelief. He's, he's proclaimed the truth of the world for these three years or so. They've rejected him. But that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love the lost people of the world. He does. He loved you and me while we were sinners and lost. He loves every person on the face of the earth today. But Jesus prayed here specifically for his disciples because of the mission that they were going to have to undertake. And his prayer was specifically for two things. First, for the disciples' preservation. Keep through thy own name. That is, protect them, Father. Those are, some of them read those and say these words and say, well, God must be weak because it seems that all those men died martyrs or had trouble. Now for the doubters out there, remember this. Not a single one of those disciples died a martyr's death before fulfilling the mission that God had for them to fulfill. Think about Stephen. Not one of the apostles, but think about him. As he's being stoned, he's still witnessing. His life was not taken from him until he completed what God wanted him to do. Your life's in God's hands. He'll call you home when he's ready for you, but you have something to do right now. God protected them. If you simply read your Bible, you'll see there are many times that the apostles fell into the hands of wicked men. They were in prison. They were put on trial. Their lives were on the line, yet they were able by the power of God to continue their mission to preach the gospel. And many people came to Jesus for salvation. God protected them. He also protects you and me. Secondly, he prayed for their sanctification. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. The apostles were set aside. That's sanctification. Hegias. For the purpose of Jesus Christ. Just like we are today. When you are born again, you are a saint. That's right. You don't have to live, be dead 200 years to have miracles to your credit to be a saint. The moment you come to Jesus Christ for salvation, you are sainted. You are set aside for a purpose. Let me give you another solid truth right here and now. This world is not preserved in its rebellion or it's not sanctified in its unbelief. The world has always thought it could change things for the better by protesting, by re rebelling against authority by setting up their own religious system, and it fails. See, they miss the fact that the only thing that will change this world, that will change your life, is Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And yet the world hates Jesus. And they hate God the Father. And they hate the church. And they hate anything connected to God. Jesus prayed for the protection and sanctification of his disciples because of God's ownership of them by creation, for they are thine. They're yours, Father. And the Lord prayed that, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine. You see, he's now revealing his unity, his intimacy, and his equality with God the Father. Everything you have, they're mine. Everything I have is yours. There's a unity there. In the old dispensation, God dwelt among his people and showed his glory in the tabernacle in the wilderness, for example. In Jesus, God's glory is displayed. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And after the ascension, Christ's disciples glorified him. And I am glorified in them, Jesus said. Today in the church age, the dispensation of grace, the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son. When Jesus was speaking of the Holy Spirit back in John 16, He said, He shall glorify me. And as believers, we are to glorify Jesus Christ the Son. Ephesians 1.12 That we should be the praise of His glory 
who first trusted in Christ. Jesus will soon depart. He's going back to the Father. His disciples will continue in this world. Yet the disciples had to stay in this world. It was important for them. It was a job to be done. They had to carry out God's plan in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and planting churches. Planting churches. Not building buildings. The early church had no buildings. The early church met in caves. They met in houses wherever they could. They planted churches. You know, we, get, we have a, a faulty idea that to plant a church, you have to have a building. We could have church services out in the grass where two or three are gathered together. Don't misunderstand building a church and planting a church. And when the church that they planted began to take root, it grew. And it's what I like to describe as a tale of two cities. There's a city of God, the church, and the city of man, the world. They built that city by carrying out God's plan. And since the disciples will be in the world, Jesus prayed for their protection. The world has always been and continues to be a place of great hostility against God and all the things pertaining to Him, including every believer and His church. It was that hostility, that hatred that fell upon Jesus Christ and would, with His departure, fall on that tiny band of apostles and then on the followers of Jesus. We don't know what persecution's like. You go back to that first century church, you would see what the cost was. Christians were being burned at the stake and singing hymns. They are being fed to the lions and praising God. And we complain if we don't get the right order to restaurants. We need to praise God in everything we say and do. Now when Jesus calls His Father Holy Father, that pointed to God's distinction from sinful creatures. I want to say something which will in no doubt cause many people who might be listening to this message over the internet, well, they're going to become angry. I guarantee you that's what I'm going to say. The truth is, the Holy Father does not live in Rome. He's not there. That man is only a man. He's only a sinner. And I'm going to tell you something. He's not Christ's vicar on earth. If it makes you mad, so be it. But that, you know, call no man father. Don't do that. The holiness of God the Father, the Holy Father, is the basis for the believer's separation from the world. God would protect them from sin, the sin and the hatred of this world, by the power of His name. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth unto it and is safe. Wow. How many times do you run to the Lord in that strong tower when you need Him? Jesus prayed for the preservation of His disciples in this manner. Verse 11, Keep through Thy own name those who Thou hast given Me that they may be one as we are. Uh-oh. That's an important and powerful request. Did you see it? Jesus' prayer was to promote unity of believers, which is patterned after the unity of the Father and the Son, that they may be one as we are. The unity here speaks of unity of will and purpose. We cannot even get along with our born-again brothers and sisters. Well, they don't believe this and they don't believe that. We need the unity, folks. That doesn't mean accepting false doctrine. It doesn't mean knuckling down under to some false teaching. It means that we are one in purpose. We are one in will. And that is to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. I don't care what denomination you are. The, that's the mission of the church. You know, denominations are not in the Bible. 
Denominations are man-made. So it's the will and purpose of God to make way for the salvation of man. And the purpose of the believers to have unity one with another and to tell others that way to salvation. We spend too much time arguing with each other rather than being out in the field doing what we're supposed to do. And the devil loves it. He does. When we are arguing with brothers and sisters about things that are unimportant, it takes our focus off the job we need to be doing. We can't save anyone. But we can tell them how to be saved. We can take them to Jesus. We can take them to the cross. We can take them to that unoccupied tomb and let the Holy Spirit work. And by being protected from the world, the disciples would be unified in their desires to serve and glorify Jesus Christ the Son. As I read this passage of Scripture, I cannot help but see the Good Shepherd displayed here in verse 12. Listen again. See if you don't hear the Good Shepherd. I have kept them in thy name. Those thou hast given me, I have kept. And none of them is lost. That small flock of sheep, the disciples, were entrusted to the care of Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, the great shepherd. He didn't lose a one. You know, theologically, there's a term for that. Eternal security. I can't help it. Every time I come across a passage, I have to tell you it's eternal security. Hmm. There was, of course, an exception. That was Judas. He's described as the son of perdition. Jesus did not lose Judas because Judas was never a believer. He was doomed to destruction. He was never one of Jesus' sheep and his true character was finally manifest. Jesus, Judas was the dead branch from John 15. You remember that? I am the vine, you are the branches. The dead branches cast into the vine. He was a dead branch. Judas was just like the world. He did what he wanted to do. In this case, he sold Jesus. He betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. And that is a perfect picture. Judas is of the world. He coveted money, and yet he never got to enjoy his ill-gotten gain. He wanted it so much, but it was no use to him. He wasted his efforts on worldly things that did not last. Yet old Judas was an unwilling, unwitting tool of Satan. John 13, 20 says, And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Because he wasn't Jesus. He didn't belong to Jesus. Judas made a willing choice. And we see that even people's willing free acts fit into God's sovereign plan. Even though Judas willingly betrayed Jesus, it fulfilled the words of Psalm 41.9 where David writes about betrayal by his friend. Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, had lifted up his heel against me. That was Judas. The words of comfort spoken by Jesus, these things I speak to his disciples were a great benefit to them. Following Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, they would recall His words and they would experience the full measure of His joy. Have you ever thought about the joy they felt in that upper room on the night that Jesus came through that locked door? They had been hiding away. They had been frightened for their life. And Jesus comes in and says, Shalom, peace. Can you imagine the joy they felt then? The joy of Mary Magdalene when she saw him. The joy came because they knew Jesus' words were true. He had conquered the evil one and brought eternal life to them and to all born again believers. So again, we see those two important things. Something else he talks about. First, the value of the disciples. And second, the danger they would be facing. The disciples were valuable because they had received the word of God. I have given them thy word. 
That's important. Because you know, we are so blessed we have this. The early church didn't have that. They had the word spoken by mouth. Receiving the, God, receiving the word of God is a wonderful thing, but what you do with it after you receive it is the most important thing. And the disciples carried that word into the world. Yet those men who were following the Lord's command, taking the gospel into the world, were in danger because the satanic world system hated them. The world hated the disciples for the same reason it hates us. Because they were not of this world. Isn't it amazing? How, they're not of this They're different. And don't tell me that you don't have those feelings you have to fight because someone is different. From a different country, a different race, a different religion, a different this, a different that. We're not of the world and the world hates us. As believers, share Jesus Christ. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2.16 That's why we share the gospel. That's what the world is. For born again believers, the world loses its attractiveness. If it doesn't lose the attractiveness for you, you better take a good long look at your heart and a closer relationship you have with Jesus Christ. You need to take a look at those things. A believer's commitment to Christ and His Word shows the world's values to be trash. Or as Philippians 3.8 says, dumb. That's what the world is. Their values. And the world hates the exposure of their sham values. That's the reason cults are so difficult to reach for the Lord. Because they don't want to have their false teachings exposed by the light of truth. That's the reason the cults change the Word of God. And sometimes just one little word, one little article adjective changes it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And they say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. It's the God in Greek. They put a God, which means they're polytheistic. You change the Word of God. You change the Word of truth. <clears throat> You have to stand for the truth. And they don't like it. They run from the light. John 3.20 says, Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds be reproved. God's plan was not to remove the disciples from danger and opposition. Should have taken them out of the world. No, but request was to preserve them in the midst of conflict. Keep them from the evil. You can be sure the devil, the evil one, was always on the attack against any Christian who is standing up for Christ today. Think about it. If the devil is leaving you alone, you are not serving the Lord as you should. But if you're starting to make waves out there, if you're starting to get the message out, he's going to attack. He's going to attack hard. He did that to the disciples. I mentioned a bit ago, even though Jesus will be taken out of the world, His followers are going to remain in it. But I'll tell you something, like Daniel in Babylon, or the saints in Caesar's household were told about in Philippians, God intends for His followers to be witnesses of the truth in the midst of the same satanic falsehood that they faced 2,000 years ago. Only I'm going to tell you something, it's worse today. Is that an easy task? Absolutely not. But it is absolutely impossible without the protection of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have that, you have nothing. Now let me be clear about this. This world is full of satanic falsehood. It's full of lies of the devil, lies from the pit. Satan, the evil one, is the head of this wicked world system. And he seeks to do everything that he possibly can to destroy the believers. But God's plan will prevail. Think about that. When you feel defeated, remember God's plan will prevail. If you don't believe it, read the end of the book. Christians must not take themselves out of the world 
must, but must remain in meaningful contact. Trusting God's protection as a witness for Jesus. If we completely remove ourselves from the world, who's going to proclaim the gospel? That's a rhetorical question. The answer, of course, is no one. Just as Jesus did not belong to this satanic world system, I'm not of the world, he said. So believers do not belong to this world system either. Believers belong to a heavenly kingdom. Colossians 1.13 who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That's because of our new birth. But you know something about that passage? If you're in the kingdom of his dear son right now, here it comes. That's eternal security. God sees you with him right now. If God sees you with him now, when you, you were called home, where are you going to be? With him. And just as Jesus explained to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. You must be born again. Now, the petition was also for their sanctification. Sanctify them through that truth. Thy word is truth. As I said, sanctified means to be set apart for a special use. The believer is to be distinct from the world's sins, from the world's values and from the world's goals. That, this means that the sanctifying work is God's truth. We live in a world where every, people believe anything. I read it on the internet, it must be true. I heard it on the news, it must be true. They believe everything but God's Word. And God's Word is truth. The truth is communicated in the Word, which is both personal and it's proved to be true. As the message about Jesus was heard and believed and understood, the disciples' hearts and minds were captured. It began little by little until they had grasp on it. The change in their thinking resulted in a change in their living. Just like it should be for us. As believers... Take to heart God's word in your life. They are sanctified. They are set apart for God. And there's a notable change in the living of a born again believer. And you know what? It's done for the glory of God. It was God's message that set the apostles apart from the world. So they would do God's will. Not Satan's. Not the world's. God's will. The world's involved in doing the will of Satan. The world disregards the Word of God. It disregards the Word's instructions for living. And most importantly, it disregards the instructions for salvation. Jesus Christ is the model, the role model for every single believer. Thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world. Jesus Christ was in the world, but he was never of the world. Jesus was sent into this world on a mission by his Father. And the same token, the believers are sent into the world on a mission by the Son to make the Father known. And as much as Jesus' prayer was for the disciples, it wasn't limited to those immediate hearers. This passage it actually is very similar to the Great Commission, isn't it? Thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world, and you bring it down to us, He has sent us into the world. We have a job to do. And it is no less important than Peter or Paul or James or any of the apostles. Each Christian it should view himself as a missionary whose task it is, is to communicate God's truth to an unbelieving world. John 17, 19 says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. It was for the benefit of the disciples that Jesus sanctified himself. And you might ask, in what sense did Jesus need to sanctify himself? Wasn't Jesus already set apart? to God and distinct from this world? That's true. But this sanctification refers to 
Jesus being separated and dedicated to his death. And the purpose of his death was that they also might be sanctified through truth. God's truth is the means of sanctification. You can't be set aside for the purpose of God until you come to God. The purpose of the death of Christ is to dedicate or separate believers to God and His program. And we're separated this morning. If you're not separated, you have a problem. Because you're not going to see the kingdom. You need to come to Jesus before it's eternally too late. Jesus is praying for you too. We'll get to that. He hasn't taken you out of the world yet because you have something you need to do for Him. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And He's going to see it through. And the wonderful thing about our God, if you fail, He'll forgive you. But he'll bring somebody else in too to finish that job. His plan and his purpose will prevail. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a powerful portion of Scripture as we watch our Lord pray for the disciples. And in some cases, he's actually praying for us too. I know he's interceding for us right now this morning. And I feel his presence with us today. As always, we give people time now to talk with you, to open their hearts to you. And if they've never made a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ to come to Him for salvation, I pray that this would be that day they would say yes and come home to you. And I know that we have troubles and worries in our lives. Help us to turn them over to you. And I'm sure the Holy Spirit is tugging at some heartstrings this morning. Things we need to do or things we need to stop doing. And I pray that we would submit ourselves in obedience to His leading, guidance, and direction. Whatever that need is, Father, I pray that this morning they would come with open hearts to the throne of grace. And I thank You for that great privilege. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.